All right. Let me get back to my PowerPoint. All right, so we should be live on Facebook. We should also be live on Zoom. So we are ready to go. And today uh, we are gonna talk about Nebraska Sandhills. And uh, I guess I should say good morning to everybody joining us live on Zoom and also live on Facebook. I'm Tim here at Fontenelle Forest. And today's, I wanna welcome you to today's Understanding Nature program. Thank you for joining us. Today we're gonna talk, a, about something a little bit different. Um, we've kind of been talking about um, different animal species on um, the last few programs, but today we're gonna talk about more of a region. Um, and we're gonna talk about the Sandhills of Nebraska. So the Sandhills of Nebraska are a very interesting place. So it's a very diverse area. It's a, it's a land of wind, sand, grass, water, um, home to a lot of prairie dwelling plants and animals, and, and also people. For thousands of years, people have lived in the, in the sand hills. Now, the sand hills formed a long time ago. A long time ago, Nebraska was covered with a shallow inland sea. And so there were some drier years. It caused the water to evaporate, and it left behind sand. So as we know, out on the prairie, um, you know, especially in Nebraska, the wind blows. And so the wind did what the wind does in Nebraska. It blowed, it, it blowed, it blew, and it blew the sand into dunes. Um, and then those dunes were colonized by, by grasses. Now, this is a, a really an area of contrast because it's a semi-arid climate. Semi-arid means it gets between 17 and 23 inches of rain a year, which is not that much. To put it in, in perspective, here in Omaha, we average about 31 inches of, of rain or of precipitation per year. So it's a semi-arid climate, it's very dry, and it's often called a desert under grass because there's grass, but there's also sand. But in addition to that, there's also about 1600 natural lakes, ponds, and wet meadows. The sand hills sit over the top of the Ogallala Aquifer. So wherever the, the sand blows down or a, a gap in the sand reaches down to, to the water table, you get these, these wet areas. So it's this very diverse contrast between wet and dry. Um, it's also very fragile, very sparsely populated, and a very beautiful area. So this is the, the area of Nebraska that is the sand hills. This is about 20,000 square miles which is about the same area as Vermont, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island put together. So it's a very large area out here in western and central Nebraska. The dunes can get up to 400 feet high. Um, they can be 20 miles long, and the slopes can be as steep as 25%. So that's, that's quite large. And it's actually the largest sand dune formation in the western hemisphere. So here in Nebraska, we're number one. We got the number one largest sand dune formation in this hemisphere. And it's one of the largest grass stabilized sand dune regions in the world. So that's pretty amazing. And it's an important natural and economic resource. So especially when it comes to the conservation of migratory birds. A lot of migratory birds, especially waterfowl, they go through this area. And we're gonna talk about some of those in a little bit. Um, but it's very extreme. The weather in the sand hills region can be very extreme, very unforgiving. Um, I was talking uh, to a gentleman at one of the programs I did, and he grew up in the sand hills, and he was telling me about the, the winter of 1949 when they had 100 inches of snow out in the sand hills. So out, he said in the springtime, because the cattle had just kept lifting their heads and lifting their heads, in the springtime, they found all the cattle that had perished in that, in that blizzard because their, their noses we're just starting to poke out of the snow as the snow melted. So it's a land of very extreme weather, but it's very diverse. So if you, you look at this picture and you notice you got the hills, you've got the water running through, 
And just to put it in perspective, down here is a car. I'm not sure what road this is, but there's a car down there. So you can just kind of get an idea of how open and expansive this area is. And here's another picture. And you might notice some things here. You notice you have the dry hills up here. You've got some water down below. It's very, looks very brown. Um, a lot of grasses, including, including big and little blue stem, um, sand reed grass, needle and thread. But there's one thing you'll, you'll notice is absent from this picture, and that's trees. You don't see any trees out here. Now, the settlers that were moving west um, from out east, they, I mean, we call Montana big sky country, but a lot of them got out here and they, they couldn't take the big sky. They were coming from the eastern uh, part of the United States, which was very forested. And a lot of them had come over from Europe, which was very forested. So they got out here and there was not a single tree to be seen. Um, so that was, that was very hard for them to take. That's actually one of the reasons why um, people wanted to preserve Fontenelle Forest was because it reminded them of those forested areas back east. Now the history of the sand hills um, includes people. So native cultures date back thousands of years in this area. Uh, most were nomadic. They followed game herds. Um, there were some villages and they grew some limited crops. But as you'll see, as we'll talk about later, um, it's, a, it's a difficult place to grow crops. So the Plains tribes in this area date back about 600 years. And at the time of European settlers arriving, there was about 10 tribes that, that lived in this area. And they used mainly horses to hunt bison. Um, they were mostly nomadic. Um, and they did go into the sand hills to, to hunt game. Now, in 1869 to 1885, this was the open range period. So at that point, cattle ranchers started moving in. They started claiming large swaths of land. Um, and the bison were gradually replaced by cattle as the primary grazers. And here's a rancher from the 1880s. So you can see he's got his lasso. He's got his, his uh, pistol here. He's got his, his rifle. So he's out there ranching. I had a gentleman in a program that had this very same mustache. It was a beautiful thing. Now the Homestead Act of 1862 let people claim 160 acres of land and they had to work it for five years. Um, and so a lot, of these, a lot of these farmers started moving west to, to make their, their own way to claim these, these 160 acres. So a lot of farmers started moving out there. And what they found out once they got out there was that 160 acres of sand hill land was really not enough to support um, a family because crops didn't grow well. Now in 1904, the Kincaid Act increased that amount of land you could get to 640 acres. So that allowed for a little bit more land to scratch out a living. But still, um, from 1904 to 1917, over 9 million acres of Sandhill land was claimed by, for homesteading. For about, that's about 14,000 claims. So a lot, of, a lot of them tried and failed to grow crops. It was just too dry. The land really lent itself to grazing. But as the, the settlers moved in, they started fencing off swaths of land. They wanted to keep the ranchers' cattle out, and they wanted to you know, keep their, try to grow those crops. And this caused a lot of conflicts between the, the existing ranchers that were out there and the new settlers moving west that were starting to try, to try and claim those, those swaths of land and to, to make a living. So they started erecting barbed wire and we're gonna get into a little bit more of those conflicts um, towards the end of the program. But first I wanna tell you about some of the unique features and the unique creatures and uh, plants and animals that live out in the sand hills. So now this is a, a common feature in the sand hills. This is called a blowout. 
So a blowout occurs where plants and their roots become depleted. And of course, as we said, we know what the wind does in Nebraska, the wind blows and it will literally blow a hole out of the landscape. And that's what causes this blowout. Plant roots get depleted, the wind starts to blow, it blows the sand away, it blows a hole into the ground. They can be a few feet wide, they can be hundreds of feet wide. And sometimes they'll get deep enough that they'll reach that groundwater and it becomes kind of a, a, a pond or a, a, a wet meadow. But it's hard for plants to reestablish in a blowout. Once the, the plant roots are depleted and this blowout begins, then it, it's very difficult for plants to get reestablished because the wind just keeps blowing and blowing. Now, ranchers are very careful about overgrazing because overgrazing can cause a blowout because that depletes those plant roots. Um, Fire and fire suppression decreased the number of blowouts in the sand hills. Now that sounds like a good thing, but a certain degree of grazing and fire was natural in this landscape. So fires occurred with relative frequency. You had the bison out there before cattle grazing, but the, the bison would graze and move on. Cattle tend to be contained, and so they're more likely to overgraze. So if, that fire suppression, that decrease in, in blowouts, that sounds like a good thing. You're decreasing blowouts, you're decreasing erosion, you're, you're maintaining or increasing your amount of grazable land. But the problem with that is that it allowed invasive species to move in. So one of those invasive species was the, the Eastern red cedar or the juniper. That fire suppression allowed those invasive trees to move into these areas. Now there are some species that thrive in the blowouts. One of those is, is this, the blowout penstemon, um, also sand moly. And these plants stabilize the soil. So penstemon, this blowout penstemon, also known as Hayden's penstemon, only grows in active blowouts. So it's, it was actually thought extinct in 1940. So in 1940, they thought this plant was gone. Um, it was rediscovered in 1968. And that's because uh, blowout penstemon reproduces by rhizomes one way, but it also produces seeds. So the seeds will fall off the plant in, in August or September, and they can stay dormant uh, for, for decades. They can they'll bury themselves in the sand, and they require some very specific um, conditions to germinate. So they require um, some, some prolonged wetness. So they have to get get damp, stay damp for a while. And they also need to, to be um, abraded to a certain point. Well, now abrasion is easy when you're buried in sand that's blowing around. Sand's blowing around, it's, it's kind of scratching up, abrading that seed coating. And then once it gets some of that dampness from prolonged wetness, then it can, it can germinate. So, so the plant came back from some of these seeds that were buried in the sand um, and now it's native to nine counties in Nebraska and a single location in Carbon County, Wyoming, out in eastern Wyoming. So the thing about blowout penstemon is it's very easily outcompeted, but it serves a very important function. So because it, it is usually the one of the first to colonize these blowouts, it helps stabilize that blowout, which allows other plants to move in. So it's its role, its very important ecological role is to stabilize the blowout and allow other plants to colonize. Now you might recognize this, this is yucca, also known as soap weed. So settlers would make soap from the roots of the yucca plant, that's why it's called soap weed. Um, Native Americans also used it for food. There's a lot of edible parts, the roots are edible, kind of like a potato. Um, I believe the flower blossoms are also edible. Um, they would use it for fiber. The leaves made good fiber for baskets and things like that. But it's also an indicator of disturbed land. It likes to grow in disturbed areas. So again, ranchers, they, they're very careful about overgrazing because if you get a lot of Um, 20 feet deep. Oh, I'm 
getting a message like, you guys lost my sound. Let's see, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Huh, I'm not sure I didn't touch anything. And now I have no sound. So let's see if we can fix that. I'm back. I'm back. All right, I'm back. Hey, <laughs> excellent. Well, sorry about that. A little technical difficulty. So I was saying that that yucca um, have very deep tap roots. Their roots can go about 20 feet, um, and they they can get that water from deep underground. And they're they're an indication of um, of disturbed land. And they grow these beautiful white blossoms um, that grow kind of upside down. They're very fragrant and they're very adapted to drought, um, to fire and to grazing pressures. And the, one of the interesting things about the, the yucca plant is that they're pollinated by the yucca moth. So there are different um, species of yucca plant and they're each pollinated by their own species of yucca moth. So they're totally interdependent. So after mating, the female yucca moth will, will gather pollen from one plant. She'll fly to another plant. Um, she'll lay her eggs in the ovary of the flower, and then she'll pollinate it. And by pollinating it, she ensures that that flower will produce a fruit. And that fruit is then going to provide food and shelter for her larva when they hatch. So the larva will eat some of the fruit. They'll drop to the ground. They'll burrow in. Um, and then they'll make a, a cocoon and they'll wait for next year and then they'll hatch out as yucca moths. So another species that thrives solely in blowouts is the sandy tiger beetle. Now worldwide there's about 2,000 species of tiger beetle. Um, in North America there are about 100 species of, of tiger beetle. But the sandy tiger beetle is restricted to blowouts. So they're very sensitive to disturbance. And they are an aggressive predatory beetle. Um, they can run 5.6 miles an hour, which in human terms doesn't necessarily sound like a lot, but in beetle terms, that's really fast. So it's actually faster than his tiny little brain can process information. So they will hunt by sprinting very quickly, but then they have to stop because their brain can't process their brain can't process the information, so they have to stop and get reoriented. So they can fly 20 to 30 feet. So if they need to move from one blowout to the other, they can when necessary or to escape um, predators. They only live about six weeks and they're, they're eaten by robber flies, lizards. Um, some birds will also eat them. This whitish back reflects the sun. So that helps keep them cooler in the summer. And actually, when you look at them close up, they're very, they're very pretty with this iridescent blues and greens. Um, and their main threat is habitat loss, so that they need those blowouts to survive. Now, this little guy is an American burying beetle, also a threatened species, an endangered species. These guys eat carrion, so they find dead animals, animals that have died. Um, they will lay eggs in it. So they're very important to recycling those nutrients and recycling um, those animals that pass away back into their into the environment. So they're about two inches long. They're they're nocturnal and they really prefer very large areas that don't have people. So what will happen is mated pairs will ba battle other mated pairs uh, for a control of a carcass, usually something smaller, a rabbit, a squirrel. Um, something like that. Um, the winners get to get to bury the carcass. They'll secrete a substance that slows down its its decomposition, and the female will lay between ten and thirty eggs. And then when the larvae emerge, they consume that carcass in about a week. Sounds disgusting, but it's actually a very important role in the ecosystem for, especially in those drier areas, for recycling those nutrients. Now, the interesting thing about the burying beetle is that their decline started in the 1880s. So this green line represents their historic range. 
of the American burying beetle. So by the 1880s, they were, they were noticing these beetles were on the decline. Um, by the 1920s, they were gone east of the Appalachians. They were pretty much completely gone. And the reason why is habitat loss, which now you think about the 1920s, this wasn't exactly a super populated area, but in their case, there, it was light pollution that caused their habitat loss. Light pollution really um, undid the burying beetle, which I find it just fascinating. So nowadays they're only found in primarily in the Sand Hills region. You can see here in Nebraska, a little bit in South Dakota, a little bit down here in Kansas and Oklahoma, Arkansas. And then there's a very small population out in Rhode Island. Now, of course, one of our most famous residents here, actually not residents, I should say, um, but visitors to the Sandhills in Nebraska is the Sandhill Crane. So the Sandhill Crane, I find fascinating, it has Sandhill in the name, but what most people don't realize is Sandhill Cranes don't live here. They, Sandhill Cranes don't live here, they don't nest here, they just stop by. Now, Cranes as a species have been around for about 34 million years. They're one of the most successful and oldest forms of life on the planet. Um, the Sandhill Crane in North America, the Sandhill Crane in particular, really hasn't changed much in about 10 million years. They've been around largely in this, in this form for 10 million years. Now, unlike a heron, which they kind of resemble a heron, um, they don't they don't actually feed in the water. They, they'll forage for grains, um, insects, um, and other invertebrates in the prairies and the grasslands. So they, they don't, and, and marshes, but they don't really um, spend as much time in the water as a heron would. They, they roost in the water at night to be safe from predators, um, but other than during the day, they're usually up here in the grasses foraging for insects and grains. And I actually have, this is a, a model crane here. So you can kind of see how big they are. And there's his head and body compared to me. Here he is next to me. And this is just a plastic model. But they're pretty good size. Now, the reason that they're famous in Nebraska is that every year, between four and 600,000 um, congregate on about an 80 mile stretch of the Platte River here in, in the Sand Hills region. Um, you, in the spring, they show up generally in three waves. They stick around about four or five weeks. Uh, they start in mid-February and they leave by the, the middle to end of April. And what the reason they come here in the spring is to fatten up. So they come up from their, their wintering grounds down here in, in Texas in the, in the south. And they stop by this area of the plat because it's a, it's a great place for them to fatten up. They like to fatten up on the waste grain and they gain about 20% of their body weight. And then they continue on their migration up here into the Arctic and subarctic, which is where they nest and mate and lay eggs. So they, and they, they do mate for life and the single cranes will pair up during this time. So a lot of times when they're here on the plat, they're doing their mating dances. The single cranes are, are looking for a mate. So they're, they're doing their mating dances. They're, they're performing, they're, they're very demonstrative. It's, it's really a neat thing to see. Now, along with the, the sandhill crane, um, about 20 million other birds kind of go through the sandhill area too on their migration. There's over 300 species that utilize this flyway and utilize the sandhills region as a stopping point on their migration. Um, that includes the 300 or so whooping cranes that are left, so a very endangered species. 90% of the white-fronted geese stop through here, about 2 million snow geese, 50% uh, of all the mallards in North America fly through here, 
um, as well as bald eagles and a lot of other species. So it's, like I said earlier, it's a very important, um, it's a very important ecosystem, very important area for those migratory birds. Now this little guy is our sharp-tailed grouse. So sharp-tailed grouse live out on the prairie. They also have a very elaborate courtship display. And, and their, their courtship display was imitated in a lot of Native American dances, a lot of those traditional dances. Um, they sometimes will, they will roost in trees when they can find them. Um, and they'll sometimes travel several miles between their, where they roost and where they go to feed. They'll fly out before dawn, they'll, they'll forage for a couple hours, they'll return back to the, their, their roosting site for most of the day, and then before sunset, they fly out again to forage some more. Now a related species, another related bird to this, is the greater prairie chicken. And these are also a grouse of the open grassland. They're well known for their mating dances. Um, some of you watching today may have gone out to see the prairie chickens in the past and the sandhill cranes. So the males will get together in what's called a lek, L-E-K, um, and they'll raise these, these pinnae, these ear-like feathers, and inflate these orange sacks. And they'll, they'll make a kind of this hooting moan. Um, they actually call it a boom, and the lek is known as the booming ground. So that the hens will nest nearby, and they'll, they'll come out to find a, a mate, and they'll lay between seven and 13 eggs. And this is just a short video. Um, that shows these booming grounds. We had a series of what we call chicken tours this spring. We ran for, uh, I guess, about a week, maybe a little bit more than a week during the early part of the greater prairie chicken booming season. So in the springtime, the males get together and create these leks or moving grounds where they display, they defend their little territories, and that's when the females come in and breed. And so it's a it's a uh, a, a neat wildlife spectacle sort of event. Scene. that gets the guys really excited and 
you know, like throwing gasoline into the whole situation. So that's when they really start displaying a lot. Uh, you'll get a little bit of combat between the males. Um, it just kind of supercharges the situation because uh, the females don't come in very often. So you know, you got to make you got to make your statement when you have your opportunity. And it's, you know, being outside on the prairie at dawn, it's an early morning activity, so you've got to be there at dawn. Uh, you know, that's when the landscape is waking up. So all those other noises and the sunrise goes away, but it's, you're not disappointed to be out there on the prairie. So I think my, my favorite quote is, you got to make your statement when you have the opportunity. So that's, that's good advice. So another uh, species we'll find out on the plains and in the sand hills is the western meadowlark. And this is the, the Nebraska state bird. Um, you're, they're often easier to hear than they are to see. Let's see, we'll get them to, there he goes. Uh, so these guys live in, in grasslands, meadows, pastures. Um, they eat seeds and insects. Um, they'll also eat grains, especially in the winter and early spring. Um, and they'll, they'll probe the soil um, for insects. And what they'll do is they'll actually jam their beak in. They'll do, it's called gaping. They jam their beak in and they pry it open and that lets them get at some um, insects and things that, other, that others uh, can't reach. And I've got a request to play the sound um, and see if I can increase the volume on my computer if that'll help you guys hear it. That's our. That's our meadow lark. So I have here. Uh, I have here my my stuffed meadow lark. You can kind of get an idea about the size of a robin or a blue jay. Very beautiful. With that bright yellow front, and kind of that black necktie. And a lot of times you'll see these guys singing from a, a fence post, just like you, the one in the picture here. Or you'll see them out in the, in the country. Now you don't really see them, uh, you don't really see them in your neighborhood or in the city like you do other birds, and that's because they're a ground nesting bird. So they'll, they'll make a nest in the long grass. They'll kind of have this partial dome over the top. Um, so you don't, you don't really see them in your backyard or here at Fontenot Forest. They like to be out on the prairies and in the meadows. Now this is a, a species not everybody wants to see. This is a prairie rattlesnake. The prairie rattler uh, ranges in the middle of, this, of the U.S. from Canada down to Texas and from Idaho to Iowa. Uh, we don't often get them out this far east, um, but we can. And I've heard um, recently there was one removed from uh, Walnut Creek Lake out in Papillion. So they do sometimes show up around here. They can get up to about 35 to 45 inches. Um, and they add a segment to this rattle. Every time they molt, they add a segment to their rattle. Um, they mate midsummer. Um, the young are born in August or October between there. Litter size is based on the female size. They can, they can have anywhere between five and 25 babies. Um, but there's a very high mortality rate of rattlesnakes, prairie rattlers in the first year. So they're eaten by a lot of mammals, um, a lot of raptors, king snakes, um, things like that. Now in the winter time, they gather together like a lot of other snakes. 
called brumation. It's their form of hibernation. And a lot of times all the snakes will find the same den, they'll return to the same den sites um, to, to make it through the winter. Now this is a Blanding's turtle. The Blanding's turtle is a species of semi-box turtle that lives out in the sandhills. So they've got this distinctive yellow throat and the speckled um, head, speckled carapace on their shell. And they live in these wetlands that are between the dunes. So they're nomadic and they're, so one of their biggest threats is habitat loss. They really need those interconnected wetlands um, in order to survive. And they're an omnivore. They eat some plants, they eat bugs, small fish, um, things like that. They're, they're eaten by raccoons, owls, foxes, um, but they have a very long lifespan. They, they average lifespan of a Blanding's turtle um, is between 18 and 22 years, and they can actually live up to 40. So very long lived species. Now, of course we have the coyote. I've talked a little bit about coyotes when we talked about wolves, but the sandhills of Nebraska would have been part of their natural range. So prior to us eliminating wolves, um, coyotes were pretty much restricted to the Great Plains. So the, the sandhills would have been great coyote habitat. Um, coyotes, um, some features of coyotes, they do run with their tails down. Um, they're very vocal, of course. We, you know, we've heard, we have coyotes here in Fontenot Forest. Uh, I heard them last night, yipping and yowling. Um, oftentimes, you'll, they'll be solo. They sometimes um, get into family uh, groups or family packs. And I have here, I have here a coyote pelt. So you can see, and my background is a, a picture of the, of the sand hills, and you can see that this, this pelt, this coloring, this tan and brown and kind of blackish coloring would have been very, very good camouflage out there on the plains in those, in those grasslands. And I love coyotes, I think they're neat. Not, not a lot of people like them. Ranchers don't particularly like them because they will um, sometimes attack um, smaller livestock or calves, uh, but I think they're really cool. The bison. The bison historically was a keystone species of the, of the Great Plains and of the, of the, the sand hills. So their grazing helped maintain um, the ecosystem balance. And the Plains Indians, the Plains, the Native Americans that lived out there on the Plains, the Plains tribes, they really depended on them. And they used every part of the bison. They would use um, the hides for clothing or for, for teepees. They would use the horns, um, bones for tools, um, bladders and other organs for uh, water carrying. Um, and, and of course they would eat the meat. So they were very dependent on these bison. Now nowadays, um, people ranch bison out there. They raise them for food. And actually the, the largest producer of bison for human consumption is media mogul Ted Turner. So, and he's a very, um, very good conservationist. So the, the mission statement of the Turner ranches is to manage Turner lands in an economically sustainable and ecologically sensitive manner while promoting conservation of native species. So he's raising bison for human consumption, but he's also concerned about conservation of native species. And he owns, um, he has six ranches out there in the sand hills. Um, he has 5,000 head of genetically pure bison that he raises. Um, and altogether, he has um, in his six holdings, he has um, over 500,000 acres of sand hill land out there. So you know, there's a lot of species that live out there. Now, the other thing that happens, and I think this happens in a lot of um, a lot of the harsher types of of ecosystems, is it breeds myths and legends um, and characters. So you may not know this. You know, Loch Ness has a monster. Nebraska has a monster too. And it is the monster of Walgren Lake. 
So Walgren Lake, also known as Big Alkali Lake, out near Hay Springs, Nebraska, which is on the western edge of the sand hills, um, they, have, they have a monster that supposedly lives in, in Big Alkali Lake. Now, the first official reports of the monster of Walgren Lake occurred in 1921. So um, in, 19, in September of that year, the city council of Hay Springs actually proposed taking a net and dragging it through the lake to catch the monster. Well, there was one problem with that plan and that was they didn't have a, bit, a net big enough. So they scrapped that plan. But in 1922, the Hay Springs News carried the headline, Monster Seen at the Surface Again. And in 1923, the Omaha World Herald carried a story. Um, a man named A.J. Johnson claimed that he and his friends saw a water monster. It was 40 feet long, dull gray or brown. It had a horn-like um, object between its eyes and nostrils, very similar to an alligator, but much larger and heavier. It emitted a dreadful roar and it dove beneath the surface. Now they actually did get a, they got a picture of this monster. And there it is. You can see it. It's variously been described as a large catfish, uh, a large mud puppy, a giant horned alligator, a beast that devours livestock and waterfowl. Um, descriptions of its size varied from that of a yearling steer to two feet wide, 10 to 12 feet or 40 feet long. And the one report said it spouted like a whale. So now you can see that even back then, even before the age of the internet and of Facebook and all that kind of stuff, people were still perpetrating hoaxes. Now this particular hoax, yep, sorry, it was a hoax, um, was the invention of a gentleman named John G. Mayer. John G. Mayer was a newspaperman, a businessman, a politician, a veteran, and he created and maintained several hoaxes um, and sensational stories, probably for his, you know, the, to sell copies of his newspaper. Um, at one point, he created a concrete man um, from cement. He used a buffalo soldier as a model, and he planted it near Chadron um, for archaeologists to find. Archaeologists found this concrete man. They, they declared that it was a genuine petrified prehistoric man and they took it around the country and displayed it. Um, another one of his hoaxes was that he sank bags of soda in a hot springs near Chadron, declared it to be a soda springs with healing properties. Um, and one of my personal favorites, he convinced some Western Nebraskans that the British Royal Navy was sailing up the Missouri to exact revenge on Irish immigrants for their support of the Irish Republic. So he was kind of well known for this, but the monster of Walgren Lake was definitely his, his longest lasting and, and biggest hoax that he, that he ever perpetrated. Now, some of the other characters that came out of the Sandhills, um, one was old Jules. Now this is not old Jules, this is Marie Sandoz. This is Jules's daughter. Um, and she became internationally known as a chronicler of the Old West and of Native American culture. Now, Marie was born in 1869 near Hay Springs. She was the oldest of six. And her father, Jules, really disapproved of her learning to read and write. He didn't think that that was appropriate for a woman. Um, and her childhood was spent laboring on the family ranch. She actually developed snow blindness in one eye while digging cattle out of snowdrifts on the family ranch. So at the age of 17, she graduated from eighth grade and she secretly took the rural teacher's exam and she passed it and she began teaching um, in nearby towns. Now, even without a high school diploma, even at, since she only graduated eighth grade, she managed to enroll in the University of, of Nebraska at Lincoln and she continued writing, that was her passion. Although she didn't have much success for quite some time. She claimed that she had over a thousand uh, rejection slips. <clears throat> now in 1928, she returned home because her father was dying and he surprised her by asking her to write his life story. And so she did. She wrote the story called Old Jewels. 
So the story of old Jules, um, he was quite the character. So as settlers kind of started moving in um, and those conflicts were starting to increase with ranchers, um, Jules emigrated from Switzerland and he moved out to the Sand Hills. Now, when he got there, he was threatened by some of these ranchers. They, they tried to drive him out, but he was not known to be a, a shrinking violet by any means. He was known to be violent and short-tempered. And Marie's mother was his fourth wife. Um, he was known for, but he was known for being a leader in the, in the settler community. Uh, he was known for growing roots. He grew, actually grew orchards where everybody told him it was impossible. Um, but he also expected total obedience, particularly from his family, and he was known to mete out violence to anyone who, who um, crossed him. So Marie saw the worst of his temper because she was the oldest. But the book she wrote was Old Jewels, and this documented her father's decision to be a pioneer, um, the challenges of his life in the Sand Hills, his leadership in the community, his friendship with local Native Americans, um, and by 1933, all the major publishing houses in the United States had rejected Old Jewels. Um, so she had 14, 14 times her book was rejected by publishers. Now in 1935, by 1935, she had revised it and she got word that um, the Atlantic Press had held a nonfiction contest and her revised uh, manuscript of Old Jewels had actually won the contest. So even then though, she still had to fight the publisher. She had written the book in kind of a, a Western idiom and they wanted her to, um, to make it all standardized English. So, but she fought them, she retained that, that Western idiom and it became a critical and commercial success. So it was very well received. It was a book of the month club selection, but some readers were really shocked because it really painted a realistic and pretty unromantic portrait of life in the West and of the hardships of living out there on the prairie. Um, and she used a lot of strong language in the book. So Dr. Addison E. Sheldon of the Nebraska Historical Society once asked her why she put bad expressions in her father's mouth and used them more than once. He said, once ought to be enough. And Marie replied, it would not have been enough for my father. Now today, there's still a lot of ranching out there on the sand hills. And most of the ranchers that live out there are, are conservationists. They're very um, careful about not overgrazing, about taking care of those native species. So I have one last thing to share. I wanna end with a poem. And this is by A.B. Cox, um, a cowboy poet and third generation sand hills rancher. The wind, the grass, and the water, the things that never do change, they differ from season to season, but for eons they're always the same. And the grass in summer is cattle, fat to the heart with the flower, and the deer, the coyotes, and game birds are fruitful ponds of the power. In winter, grass, brown, hard, and handsome, wind, biting, breathless, and fresh. And water, cold, hard, and lonely, it puts the soul to the test. And when the wind blows my ashes through the bunch grass and settles in the prairie sand reed, and the water soaks my bones to the yucca, heaven is all that I'll need. Then spring comes and wind brings the water and sun the mystery above, a waving patch of blue stem on part of the land that I love. And then the cycle is over, the seed mixed with dew dung and sand, and life so fragile with beauty renews itself over the land. The wind, the grass, and the water, the essence of this sandhill land. I'll be here through the eons. You've mixed my soul with the sand. Well, again, I want to thank you all for joining us today, um, either on Zoom or on Facebook Live. If you'd like to become a member of Fontenelle Forest or make a donation, please feel free to visit our website or give us a call. Our front desk staff can help you with that. Um, if you'd like um, information on programs like this one for your group, um, give me a call, send me an email called Forest, they can get in touch with me. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank some of our centennial sponsors um, here because of COVID and quarantining and everything, uh, we weren't able to hold our, our traditional big fundraiser for the year. 
So these um, companies and people have generously um, kept us going so that we can keep bringing uh, programs like this to you. All right, any questions? Um, the poem author um, is A.B. Cox, that's C-O-X. Well, all right. I hope everybody has a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy. Um, when birds migrate, what causes travel in such a narrow funnel? Um, the reason they, they travel in that funnel is because they know that that area, that section of the sand hills is, um, is a great place for them to stop. Um, birds learn the, the places that are safe, the places that have food, and so they will they will travel and and aim for those places so that on their migrations. Um, how much of the sand hills is public versus privately owned? Um, I don't know. I would guess that a lot of it is privately owned. Probably most of it um, is privately owned land. Uh, ranches and things like that. All right, everybody have a good day. Stay dry. And we'll see you next time.